So the beginning of the slideshow should look like this activity based costing and it says ABC is a good supplement. You guys see that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you remember chapter two and chapter three were job order costing and um, process costing. So they were two different ways that we could allocate the manufacturing overhead. So this is the third way. I don't know if you remember, I started this semester saying throughout the semester, you're going to learn three different ways to allocate overhead. Remember, like in your financial accounting class, you learned three different ways to allocate depreciation. So in this class, you're learning three different ways to allocate manufacturing overhead. That is the main that is the only cost essentially that we're focusing on in this chapter is how do we allocate overhead and I gave you my analogy in class of the million dollars and I said I could just give it out evenly to everybody and that would be I came up with one rate and every time you came to class essentially I multiplied that number by the times you attended class that was job order costing. That was what is called the traditional way. This method is gonna be very similar to that, except it's gonna come up with multiple rates. Instead of saying, here's one rate, and every time you come to class, you get $100 or whatever. Remember, I also said I could create a rate for every time you did your homework, and I could create a rate for every time you participated in class. And we also had the rate or every time you came to class. So I could have multiple rates and that would actually be a more accurate way to allocate the money to students who were really learning or trying to learn, right? Who were, because um, the cause and effect relationship we want there is that the more you participate in class, the more you learn, right? The more you do your homework, the more you learn. So, Activity-based costing breaks that overhead down into smaller chunks, okay? So it's gonna be very similar to the traditional method, but it is going to, on this far side of this um, slide, it says use multiple cost pools. That's what I was talking about. It's going to break the overhead down into smaller chunks. So. I had some boxes, but my printer isn't working. So um, I, I could just write on paper um, and show you kind of this analogy. But if I have a million dollars of overhead and I broke it down into smaller chunks, I could say, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get my boxes in a minute maybe. <laughs> um, that, that million dollars could be broken down into a cost pool of two hundred thousand dollars and three hundred thousand dollars and five hundred thousand dollars that still totals up to a million i'm just breaking it down into smaller chunks if that makes sense the other two ways there's two other ways that it is going to differ from your traditional costing method it is going to take some of your not on the far left of this slide, some of your non-manufacturing costs, and it will actually allocate it to the product. So this is a major reason why we cannot use activity-based costing for our financial statements. It's not GAAP approved. It doesn't follow our generally up to the counting principles because it will take some of the selling and administrative cost. It will take some of the selling and administrative cost and allocate them to the product it's purely based on what is the cause of my cost right and so if it can draw some kind of relationship um, a company says every time I ship my product out to my customer I have decided to pay the shipping cost for that customer they decide they want to allocate that when they're analyzing their product margin on their customers they want to go ahead and allocate that to the customer right because if I ship a lot of stuff to one customer and I don't ship very much to another customer, my shipping costs are gonna be different, right, per customer. The one customer that is asking me to ship them a, a large volume, I'm gonna to have to pay a higher shipping cost, right? So maybe I need to charge them more, or maybe they're a customer who doesn't ask you to ship them a lot, but they have multiple orders. So every time you go, 
to the post, post office or whatever, whatever your carrier is, they're going to charge you, right? So maybe you could get them to make a less orders, right? And so in activity-based costing, it really says if there's any true cause and effect relationship be, between a cost and a product or between a cost and a client, I want to allocate it to that product. Or even on this purple line, you could say to the client, right? To the customer. The middle one says, and sometimes it will say that there's no true relationship between some of the manufacturing cost and the product or between some of the manufacturing cost and the client. So for instance, when we talk about overhead, remember we said it's like rent and sometimes it is um, your maintenance and maybe it's even your janitors, right? That clean your facility. And they're having a hard time sometimes drawing a cause and effect relationship between that janitor cleaning the facility and a, maybe a specific client or maybe a specific product. So they decide to really start classifying some of that manufacturing overhead cost that we would say um, goes to the product, they start calling it just an expense, like more of a selling and more of an administrative expense is, is a better way to say so it's it. It's a period cost instead of a product? Yes, correct. Joe is exactly right. They will now call some of that with activity-based. So they have a hard time drawing a true cause and effect relationship there. They just say, well, I have this cost and I'm going to call it more of, like Joe said, an administrative period cost and expense it. So the next slide says th those were the three main differences between activity based. And when I say traditional costing, I am talking about your gap approved, like mainly job order costing. OK, so job order costing just had one driver and you're going to see that on the homework example today. The activity-based costing has multiple cost pools, multiple drivers, multiple um, rates. So that's what makes it unique is that I kind of get more detailed. This other part of the slide says that traditional costing relies on usually the three that we said in class were direct labor hours, direct labor cost, or machine hours. So they're all volume based. But now with activity based costing, we can use any kind of activity as the driver. And shipping is a really good example because with shipping, you could use weight, you could use distance, you could use the number of times you have to ship something, right? The, the, um, the, the next slide is going to say transition or transactions versus duration on one of these slides. But the activity is the event. It's the, I like to say, remember in class, it's the cause. And so I group certain costs into, they're gonna call it cost buckets, but cost pools, I'm gonna group them together. And there's gonna be five main different levels that they call, um, or activities really is the word they use in the textbook. To classify these things that your overhead um, or even your product making goes through. Okay, so let's say we wanted to create a new product. What is one of the first things we would do to create that product? Uh, direct materials. Okay, even before that, like we have to do what? What are we gonna make? Like getting your materials. Okay, that, that's what Joe said too, but um, even think are you saying just choose what product you're going yeah, to produce okay yes go there joe so you even have to come up with a an idea right you have to come up with some kind of research and you have to develop that idea that is an act and are there costs associated with that yes there are right and so that's a cost pool that's an activity they would say okay all of the research and development cost and anything we paid, they're gonna say a prototype, right? To create that idea or that product initially, that goes into a cost pool. So I start, all, all of those costs I start incurring when I'm first coming up with my idea and creating my product, I start writing it down and titling it the product cost, right? Of just coming up with my product. 
And then what do you typically do after you've got your product and your prototype? What might you do? You might start that idea of what you guys were talking about. Actually, good, right. Actually buying the materials and starting to create the product. They're gonna call that machining. They're gonna say, when I go to produce my product, I am actually working on creating units and they're gonna call that an activity. They're gonna start lumping all the material and the labor and all of the overhead that goes into making that product. And then what do I gotta do after I made it? I gotta do what? The labor to, oh, after? After you've got it all made, what's kind of the next step you wanna do is We'll sell it. Is that that's what right. That's right. I want to sell it. Right. And so are there costs associated with getting it sold? Yeah. Which we typically called selling cost. Right. But they're going to lump that now into maybe a customer cost pool an activity. And they're going to say that is a cause that I have. That is a cost that I have that is caused by certain customers. Well, all of them, but certain customers are gonna cost me more, right? Because maybe they take more of my time or it takes more to get advertising to reach them or um, maybe they, you have a call center and, and they utilize a lot of your resources. And then they may say, what if we wanna make a new product, but how do I weave that into this process we already have? Well, there might be just be a certain, what they're gonna call setup or batch activities, certain things that you have to change. So if you were creating cereal and you came up with an idea for a new cereal, right? Well, it can flow through this whole process, but there may be some changes you have to make. Maybe you're gonna add more different marshmallows to the cereal. Well, that's called a setup cost. That I can still do the production, but I have to change certain things. When I was in um, <clears throat> school, my instructor said that making jeans was becoming like popular to acid wash them whenever he was growing up or whatever. And then they became destructed, right? Like you can buy them now and they all have holes in them or whatever. So a company that creates jeans they have to go through this extra step to make them acid washed, right? They have to start, I guess it's putting acid or, oh, it was stone washed. You put stones in the buckets and then you mix them all around with the jeans to get this look on the, you, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yes, no, okay. <laughs> Anyways, they could produce normal jeans, right? With nothing on them, but then when they wanted to, produce the stone wash jeans, they would have to take stop production, add the stones and the acid to it <laughs> and start producing again, right? Same idea if they want to create destructed jeans, they would have to stop the process and they would have to add something, the ripping part that it goes through, right? Or whatever. So that's considered a batch cost. That's a cost I incur to change my process a little bit for new things or for a group of things. Okay, I spent more time talking about that than I meant to, but that's okay. <laughs> so here is your, <laughs> here is your slide that just um, gives you definitions of those words the term cost driver and the allocation base, but basically it really just says those terms are referring to the activity, the measurement of activity that causes your cost. And then this was the one I was talking about. Typically our drivers are either transaction driven or they are time driven. So how much time does it take you to do a certain thing or how many um, units do you have to go through, hours do you have to go through, whatever. Um, and then I'm going through these fast because I wanna to get to our homework problems. These are the five levels I was talking about. Traditionally, we just used volume-based things, it says, but the five levels that you will see now in your homework Batch, that's the group of things I was talking about. Unit is actually the production. So when I am producing my product, that's a unit level thing. When I'm actually creating a new product, that was how we were talking about research and development or prototypes. Those are considered product activity things. Organization activity, sustaining. 
is the more of that general overhead that you were familiar with in the past. Uh, well, some of your rent would go in there or the janitor or some of the um, things that create just, I'm trying to give another example. This is the one where sometimes they will say, this doesn't actually get allocated to the product, that it just gets expensed. And then the customer level costs were ones that you usually called part of your selling costs, but now with activity-based costing, we're gonna add it in with the product or add it into the customer cost of our analysis. So there's two more, this thing, this is the last slide. The other verbiage that your um, book will use is, sorry, I'll go back. It will say, what's the first stage and the second stage of this process of activity-based costing? And the first stage is determine what your cost pools are. The good news for you is your homework will always do that for you. It will always determine what are the cost pools. Then it allocates that cost to each of those cost pools. And so most of the time that will already be done on your homework also. So what you will have to do is calculate this bottom section where I, I left a little blank here. Um, you have to calculate the rates and apply them. So multiply them by the actual activity. One thing I forgot, forgot to say, I'm stuck the share here, is that companies that produce two different types of products will use this activity-based costing and they will only use it as a supplement. And what I mean by that is they will still use their traditional costing system for their financial statements. So if you think of a company that produces a high-end product and a low-end product, they might run activity-based costing as a tool, as a supplement. They'll have it programmed into their computer um, to do in addition to their traditional activity, I mean, uh, financial statements, okay? So let's see, I tried this the other day and it's a little poll to see if you learned anything from that. It's kind of like a clicker quiz. Let's see, okay, first question says, which cost will activity-based costing focus on allocating? So I said this at the beginning and it is the cost that all good. I see someone's already selected the right answer. Um, here's a here's the hint. It's the one that is indirect and it is the one that we usually have a difficult time um, allocating. <laughs> that wasn't a very good hint, but the first one was a better hint. It's indirect. So this activity-based costing will focus on allocating. I'm going to give you one more second because it looks like one person hasn't clicked in yet. Sometimes you don't want to vote, but okay. The correct answer was actually, it's not letting me, oh, there we go. Manufacturing overhead. The one cost that we are focusing on allocating is manufacturing overhead. I can see why you, you may have selected selling and administrative because this activity-based costing will allocate the selling and administrative sometimes to the product in this chapter. But the one that it's mainly focusing on is overhead, okay? Let's... There's like this part in the book that breaks it down and it shows that they all do the same thing virtually other than the way that they allocate uh, manufacturing overhead as like a bunch of arrows and boxes. Okay. I think this is the diagram that Joe was referring to and it shows traditionally at the top all the manufacturing so if I had this box and it um, had this million dollars on it and it represented all my overhead, but then I wanted to break that box down into um, smaller boxes, it would really say inside this, We've got to know there are other boxes, right? And if this box, this is what I was saying, 
it's not a million dollars twice. It's maybe there's a box in here that has this is a smaller box that fit inside that big box. And it had two hundred thousand dollars allocated to it of the million dollars, right? So is that to change something in the process, right? Batch? The batch, yes, yes. It's a it's a group of things. It's a change in the process, correct. That's done for a group of things. Maybe it's when I go to ship stuff. Well, I ship stuff in groups, right? Um, maybe it's when I go to, like I said, change the production line to a new product. That I'm pretty, I change from creating a black marker to a red marker. What am I gonna have to do? There's gonna be a cost in there, right? It would be the cost of changing out the ink, yes. But it was for a whole group of, of new products. That's why it's called a batch, right? Then inside there, I need one more piece of paper. This other box, it's bigger than the other one. It says machining. It's taking the overhead, and a lot of your overhead costs would be caused by your actual production, right? 500000 And then there's one more box in there because it's got to add up to a million, right? So there was a $300,000 box in there. Can you see this one? It's a smaller box. Had some sunglasses in it at one time. Some cheap ones that were like nine dollars. So if this were a customer cost of maybe contacting my customers and following up with them about the product or helping the tech support is a customer cost, right? Or maybe you actually take orders on the phone or maybe you have people sitting there that want to chat with your customers when they get on your website, right? That's a customer level cost. So all three of these, the 500,000, the 200,000, and the 300,000 were inside this big box. I just took the million dollars and I broke it down into three or smaller boxes, right? So that's what we're going to look at your homework now. So on question seven on your homework, it asks you first to think about the traditional okay, the chapter seven, method. And I'm going to jump homework, into the homework seven, um, and show you what that you question looks like. You are asked to calculate the predetermined overhead rate. This is the traditional method where you just take the total overhead given in the problem in the paragraph here. Mine says 829,500. And you divide it by the one activity rate, by the or the one predetermined um, overhead rate usually a volume-based rate. Here it's direct labor hours. So I'm going to take this 829,500 and divide it by the total direct labor hours, which is actually given down here on my problem as 14,400. When I did that math, I got $57.60. I will need that answer when moving on to question eight. Question eight, you are applying that predetermined overhead rate. Remember, apply means multiply to the direct labor hours per product. So I was taking that $57, and I'm going to show it on my spreadsheet, and I'm multiplying it by these predetermined, by not the um, predetermined, by the direct labor hours per product. So on my spreadsheet, you can see I have the predetermined overhead rate calculated as $57.60. I'm going to multiply it by those direct labor hours per product. And I came up with these two answers. I'm going to type those in. Again, all I did was I took that predetermined overhead rate and I multiplied it by the direct labor hours of each product. This top one was product Y. And the bottom one is the smaller one, less hours. So it got allocated less money. If you want to check this, you would add these two together and it should equal the total 829,500 overhead that you started with. On the video for class, I spoke with the students that were in the Zoom session about skipping question nine because it asks you actually to work on the activity-based costing system and how that cost would be allocated to product Y. So I suggest skipping that because you will need the different activity rates. Remember, in um, ABC costing, we come up with an activity rate for each of these cost pools. So we're taking on question 10, the machining cost pool, it says $246,000 
divided by 12,000 and it was an activity rate of $20.50. I'm going to come up with that rate for all three of these cost pool, all four of them actually, by just taking this column, the estimated overhead, and dividing by the estimate expected activity. So on question 11, it was asking about the activity rate for machine setup. So it was 137,500 divided by 250. Question 12 is asking for the activity rate on product design. Product design is 89,000 divided by two products, so split amongst both of those. So 44,500 would be allocated to each. And then question 13 is asking about the predetermined overhead rate or the activity rate of the general factory. Again, I take this total here, 357,000 on mine, and I divide by its activity or its driver. And I came up with that rate. I wanted it rounded off to two decimal places. So then on question 14, I'm going to have to take all four of those rates that we calculated. Actually, it's on question 16, I believe, and allocate them. So question 14, it says, of these, which of the four activities is batch level? The machine setup is a batch level because you're doing that for a group of things. You will change over your machines for a group of products that you are um, producing. 15 asked which of these items was a product level activity, product design. When you're creating your product, that's a product level activity. And then 16 was where we had to allocate all of those activity rates that we calculated. So on my spreadsheet, you can see on this sheet two, here were those four rates that we had answered. This was the answer to um, question 10. This was the answer to question 11 and question 12. Question 13, the activity rate for those three or those four cost pools. And then in question 16, it was asking us to allocate those rates or apply them, multiply them to product Z. So you're looking at product Z, this column here gets multiplied by those four rates that you had already calculated. When I take 4,500. C11 and I multiply it by E11, the $20.50 comes up to $92,250. I'm going to do that all the way across here just for product Z on question 16. And I come up with $398,511 and that was my answer here. Going back to question 9. I'm going to actually do the same thing that I just showed you, which was multiply all of those predetermined overhead rates, but for product Y. So this column here, the first column on the data, I'm going to go to my spreadsheet and show you how I will just do the same process. I'm going to take those rates. I'm just going to copy them, put them here in these cells. Actually, just going to copy down that formula. What that formula says is you're taking the activity for product Y and you are multiplying it by the predetermined overhead rate of that cost pool. So Product Y had 40 machine setups, and the machine setup cost pool activity rate was $550 per setup, so I'm allocating $22,000. If you look, if you want to double check some of these numbers, this was the amount of the machining cost. So there was a total machining cost of $246,000. $153,750 was allocated to product Y, $92,250 was product allocated to product Z. If I add those two numbers together, it will equal that estimated cost for machining. I'm just taking 
each of these cost pools and portioning out that cost to the two different products. So my answer then on question nine will be when I sum up all of these costs that have been allocated to product Y, 430965 And I have not been logged in for a while, so I hope it will still check it. Green check. The last part we did finish up on the Zoom session. Question 17 is going to ask you to take your answers from question 8 and divide it by the total. So on question 17, have that on the spreadsheet here. Um, You are going to get those percentages by taking your answer. Those were our answers here. Answer on question eight. It was how much allocated overhead using the one predetermined overhead rate had been given to product Y and product Z. To come up with that percentage, I'm just going to take that amount that had been allocated and divide by the total overhead. So it came up to 0 0.59027. Move your decimal two places, and it'll be a 59.03%. Got to round that two up to a three. Same thing here. We took the amount that was allocated to product Z divided by the total overhead, and it was 40.97%. So if you have questions on that, please let me know. Um, I will be available through email.